Good morning. <laughs> yes, I see some of the comments are already saw talking about how cold it is today, and it is cold here too. And I feel very bad for the people working outside. We're having new siding put on, and uh, these guys are out there working in this weather. They have been for a couple of days. It could get noisy. <laughs> Just a little fair warning. Uh, you'll, you may hear a bunch of hammering and, and whatnot in the background, but uh, it is what it is, right? So, um, today I thought what I would do is I would cover some um, creative textures that we can use in our watercolor painting. Um, good morning, Sue. Hi, Anne. Hi, Maureen. Um, thank you for joining, and um, uh, sh be sure and share it so that, you know, a friend can hop in on, and join and figure out some ways to do some uh, textures in watercolor as well. So let me just switch over now to my uh, demonstration. Here we go. And uh, I'm going to be using a couple of different uh, things for this. Um, I'm going to be using a palette knife. I'm going to be using some, this is salt in this little container. I'm going to be using a um, little fan brush, which I should have found before I started. Here, this fan brush. Um, I'm going to be using some plastic wrap. And I will use a stylus as well. So, good morning. <laughs> Yeah, it really is a chilly one today. Um, I don't know what the temperature is, but it is the furnace is going non-stop, so I know it's cold outside. It's sunny, but sometimes those sunny days are even colder than the others. Um, all right, so let's let's look at some textures here for a second. Um, I don't have anything drawn out because there was a couple of different textures that I wanted to um, to share with you, and uh, one of the first is going to be stones and rocks and things like that. So we have uh, we have rocks that you know are round, okay? So you get like these round pebble-like stones and things like that. You know, we, we can create rocks like that and there'd be little ones and large ones and long ones and short ones and things like that. So you'd have a variety of rocks like this and sometimes they would be overlapping each other like this, that type of thing. And um, I'll zoom in really close for this as well, so that uh, so that you can see. I'll do these lines a little darker. I know it's a little hard to see on uh, white paper here. wrong way here there we go okay so it's gonna struggle to focus here for a minute but um, there we go so we have a, a couple of different rocks you know maybe we've got some more here in behind tucked in behind and that sort of thing so this is like a cluster of you know river rock where you have kind of they're they're worn down they're smooth on the edges and all of that sort of thing and uh, there are several types of rock you know you have you have the smooth worn down rock but then you also have the really craggy jagged type of rock as well so i'm going to show both but um, for the for the time being i'm going to uh, work on these stones here and uh, i'm going to use i'll just oh i'll use a little bit of Payne's gray here okay so i'm going to use some Payne's gray and I'm going to tear off a piece of saran wrap. Okay, just a little square. Plastic wrap, whatever you want to call it. And <clears throat> and I want to texture this one, one rock. And I'm going to texture these separately because I don't want them all to have the same texture. I want them to have some variety. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down some of the Payne's Gray here. Maybe I'll use two colors here just so that the rock has some variation. So I'll put down a little, let's 
take some burnt sienna as well. So so this rock's going to be partly partly Payne's gray, partly burnt sienna. Okay, so now I want to create, as I'm painting this, I want to create the volume of the rock. So I want to create the fact that um, it has a highlight, it has a shadow, and so on. So I'm going to say the light source is coming from here. So I'm going to make this side, this side lighter, so thinner paint, and this side is going to have a little extra paint. So a little less water, a little more volume on this one side. So I will rinse my brush. I'm going to crumple some some of this plastic wrap. I'm going to crumple it before I put it down because I find that if you put it down flat and then you crumple it, what happens is it looks like um, it, it looks like when you take a piece of fabric and you you scrunch it all up and it all comes to that one spot. So I want to crumple it before I set it down. Okay, so. Lots of good crinkles in there. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm going to push this on. And I'm going to leave it there for a little while. And I need to leave it because if I pull it off right away, that paint is wet enough that it will just flow right back into where it was, right? So you'll get no texture. So I need to leave it on there a little while because now it's kind of covered up with plastic and you know that to keep things fresh you cover it in plastic <laughs> so um, in order to um, get the full effect I will leave that on there now I can take this off in a few minutes and I'll get a soft effect if I leave it to dry completely I will get a very pronounced effect <clears throat> so um, the longer I leave it on if I leave it on until the paint is fully dry I will get a different effect than if I pull it off earlier. So I'm just going to leave that and so I'm going to make this fairly pronounced. So I'm going to leave it on there a little while. Meanwhile, I'm going to go to another area on my page and I'm going to talk about some other textures. Um, I could actually probably show this. I'll do another rock here. I can move that, that plastics out of the way enough. I can do another rock. I'm going to do this rock slightly different color. I'll start with my Payne's Gray, but I'm going to put maybe some, I don't know, alizarin crimson. I'll put alizarin crimson into this to make this one a little bit purpley. I want, I want to keep in mind, it's, again, I want to create the volume first. All right, so I want to keep my paint thinner where the light is hitting the rock. More paint, less water, on the shadow side. Now for this one, I'm going to use a little bit of salt. Now salt's a little bit, a um, little bit of a hit and miss because depending on the moment that you apply the salt and how dry the surface is or how wet the surface is and all of those things, you will get uh, uh, varying de degrees of success in terms of texture. So basically what I'm looking for is for that shine to just dull down a little bit. And that's when I find it's about the best time. So let me tip this. I don't know if you can see the shine on there. See that shine and it's, it's just a little pearly. It's a bit of a pearly finish, right? So a little satiny not bright shiny so this is a good time for me to add some salt and I'm just pinching it in my fingers and I'm going to put some on there now the idea isn't to necessarily cover the whole stone with evenly with salt that, that's not nature right it wouldn't be that even and perfect so I'm going to put that on there and uh, we'll just wait and allow the salt to do its magic so when you put salt on, and you can use a variety of different types of salt. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear the hammering, but that's what's going on here today. 
Um, but depending on the type of salt, this is just regular table salt, iodized salt, but you can use pickling salt, uh, Himalayan salt, you can use uh, kosher salt, like try different types of salt and you'll get different effects. I don't have a lot of different salts in my house right now, so I don't have a lot to show you, but the idea is the same, that you will get different effects using different salts, so try a variety. Now, you may not want to go out and buy a whole box of uh, pickling salt if you're not doing any pickling, for example, but uh, if you go to the bulk store, sometimes you can pinch a little bit and, you know, probably have to buy some other stuff because they won't just give you a pinch and, and be done with it or borrow some from somebody. Um, good morning. Uh, a lot of you ju jumped in while I was talking there. Good morning. We're talking about um, uh, textures today and how to create a whole variety here. So this one, I've got a plastic wrap on. This one, I've just added some salt. Um, yeah, I don't really have enough room there, but I can do another, I'll do another stone right here. Okay, I'll do another stone right there. And <clears throat> uh, for this one, I'm going to do some, I'm going to do a wash on this one first. So I'll start this one with just kind of a dull gray. Again, I want to keep the, the lightest part um, facing the light and add more color on the shadow side. So as I'm applying my colors and I'm trying to create the feeling of light and dark, I'm keeping in mind a couple of things. I'm keeping in mind the thinness of my paint, like how, how see-through is it, how much of the white paper is coming through my paint, and the, the temperature of the color. So this is kind of a browny, warm color, and then this side is this cooler gray, Tone, right so and I'll just I don't want it too perfect so I'm, I'm just gonna dabble it a little bit there we go get a little bit of sort of natural texture happening there And you'll notice that I didn't put the shadow just along the bottom. This is a very common thing when you're trying to create form. And you've seen this many times, I'm sure, when you've um, seen demonstrations of painting an apple. And they talk a lot about reflected light and that sort of thing. This dark area here um, would be considered the core shadow. Okay, So the core shadow is the darkest part of... Uh, you know, you're shading there. This bottom edge is where the light bounces back a little bit. So the darkest isn't always at the edge like a lot of people will do. Um, so I'm going to put that on there. I'm just going to let that dry and then I'm going to come back to this one um, to add some more to it. Meanwhile, I'm going to take a little peek under here and see what this is doing. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take this off and you can see that I've created some really cool textures here. Some of this is still wet. I can't touch this, I can't work into it at the moment, but I got some pretty cool textures there. Um, I think, I think I'd love to do another one of those, but I will, um, I will just leave it for now. You notice that when I took, when I put this on and when I took this off, I didn't slide it across the top of my paper at all. That just will only serve to smear the paint. So I've only, I put it down gently, crumpled it first, put it down gently, let it stay there, and then I pulled it off. Um, I can't really do too much in terms of creating more texture to this unless I do another layer of paint, which I'm not going to do because that'll just mess up what I've done. Then, of course, we have the familiar spattering technique. Okay, so spattering is a, is a very common um, method of creating texture. You're probably familiar with it. And, um, but of course the problem with spatter is how do you keep it confined? All right, so 
There's a lot of ways that you can go about doing this. You can take paper towels and lay it around the area to spatter. You can actually make a mask. So to, I'm just going to grab a piece of paper here. Okay, so I've got a piece of paper and if I take a pencil, okay, so I'm going to do one down here. So I'm going to take a shape. It doesn't have to be a rock, I'm just going to do a shape. So I'm going to do a shape like this. All right, that's definitely not a rock. But if if I put my pencil or if I put my paper over top, I can see it, I can trace it, I can make a mask. The other thing I can do is I can tape off, right? Now, this is thinner tape. I actually do have a much wider masking tape, which would work as well. But um, let me show you. I'm going to grab a piece of packing tape. Okay, so there's my wide masking tape. I have also packing tape, which is, which is great. Um, and what I can do um, looking for my knife. Packing tape, you always fold over the end because you'll never find it again. Okay, so I can take this and place that down there. There was something on my paper. I don't know what it is. And I can overlap this. And of course, packing tape is, is definitely something that you can see through. This is just simple dollar store packing tape. And I'm going to overlap it just slightly. Why just slightly instead of like a whole bunch? It's because what I want to do now <coughs> is remove that middle area. And if I have it overlapped, I have to cut through two layers of the masking or the packing tape. So I can carefully cut along here and I know you're freaking out at this point going oh my gosh she's gonna cut her paper I'm not you make sure your blade is nice and sharp which honestly I should have checked before I did but I'm gonna snap off a new blade just to be safe because a sharp blade really is so important so look how I'm doing this okay so the end comes off the the knife and you slide the blade in and you snap it away from yourself Oops, huh. made a liar of myself here. Oh, my thing is broken. I think, oh, there we go. Okay, so it snaps it off and just toss that away. Um, usually I wrap this in a piece of tape before I throw it in the garbage just so nobody cuts themselves, namely me. <laughs> So I just wrap it up and then I toss it out. And with a very sharp blade now, it's brand new, snapped right off, I can come along and oh, that makes a huge difference. I can really feel the slicing of the tape without damaging the paper. Now if I have two thicknesses of the uh, tape, that means I have to adjust my pressure, and that's why I don't overlap a lot. Even if I'm using like my wide masking tape for this, I don't want to use a lot of pressure. Okay, and I'm, as much as possible, I'm trying to keep my knife on on the line. So the only time I lift is when I get to a corner because it's really tricky to try and uh, line up 
and get that blade in the exact same spot that it was. All right, so let's say I want something. I, now I can either take off the background and use this as, as a mask and protect this part, or if I only want to texture this part, I lift off the center. So I'm going to lift off the center for this one. I'm just carefully catching the corner here with the blade. And this one's not coming off as cleanly because my blade wasn't as sharp, so I need to cut that one again. There we go. Alright, so I've cleanly taken that off and I've got a perfect shape now. That's a little fussy and, you know, you usually don't have to be that, that fussy about it. Honestly, that's kind of the extreme uh, way to go about this. Uh, I, I'm trying to protect, I want to protect the area above from spatters. So I'm just going to put a piece of towel there. I'm going to use this um, um, fan brush. This is a very small, you can see the, by the size of my finger, it's very small. And um, I like using this better than using a toothbrush, but it's whatever you get used to, I suppose. This one I'm really used to. Um, I hold it pretty close to the, to the uh, surface and then I just give it a tap. So I'm going to load it up with some color here and we'll put some blue on this. I'm feeling like I want to do some blues in here. So I'm filling up the, the fan brush here. I'm going to give it one little tap on my palette so I don't get a blob that comes off. So it's important to do like a little tap or something somewhere just to, to take off the excess. So that gives me a different texture than this. So I will get, you know, different it will also make a, it'll give me different um, spatters, but if I, if I thin down the color, I get larger spatters here. They will also be more diluted. So I can get quite a bit of texture here with this. And now I can take that, I can leave it just like it is if I want to, but I can also take a spray bottle. Hold, I'm going to hold it way back here. See my face? <laughs> it's, I'm holding it way back here. And I'm going to spritz it until I see some of that paint start to move a little bit. So you see that there's a couple of spatters there. And it's just starting to spread out those little droplets and it's going to give me a different texture. So I can leave that to dry. Um, if you don't have a spray bottle or if you want to get another texture still, you can rinse out that, that fan brush and you can spatter water on and that'll give you more effects. And I got a big blob there. We'll see what happens with that. The fun thing about some of these textures is that you get um, sort of natural variety. Uh, you know, you can't control how much the salt does. You can't control how, what the spatters do. Like, it, you can control it to some degree, but not entirely, which is part of the fun, I think. So, um, you can spatter into a damp or a spattered like if you spattered the surface with water first, you can spatter um, paint into it or the other way around. So let's see what this gives us. I'm going to do a little more spatter. There we go. Now I'm going to leave that to dry before I try and take off the uh, masking, excuse me, the masking tape. Let's have a look here and see what's happening up here in these other textures. So I have a rock here, and this is the one that I put the salt on. And if I do another rock, 
So I think this is dry enough on that edge there. I can do another rock right here, and I'm going to put some more salt in it. And this one will probably turn out a little bit differently because of the fact that, you know, different pigments will also behave differently with salt. So I suggest that if you are, um, if you're going to try salt in your painting, try a little of the color that you intend to use, sprinkle a little salt into it and find out what it does. Now, the paint that you use does make a difference because if you use something like a staining color, say phthalo, okay, so you're using a phthalo blue. If I used a phthalo blue on this and I did the salt, you'd get a very faint effect. And the reason being is that the, um, the staining qualities of that blue paint don't allow for the salt to draw all of the color out. It only can draw just what's sort of sitting on top. It's the paper is actually stained. So if you want a more pronounced um, salt effect, use a color that isn't a staining color. So for this, I'm going to use um, some cobalt blue. Now, Payne's Gray does have some phthalo in it. So I'm not going to use Payne's Gray for this. I'm going to use cobalt blue. And then I'm going to use a little um, burnt sienna. Okay, so I'll use some burnt sienna to get the dark side here. And I want to work carefully around my other rock. And you'll notice that when I put the salt on this one and it dries, it'll probably, at least this is my prediction, it's going to be more pronounced than the one below. And that really has more to do with the fact that it is a, there's more staining color in this one. So if sometimes you're doing these effects and they're not turning out quite as you want, it could be the paint that you're using, and whether it's a staining or a um, non-staining color. Put some salt on here. It's, it, I didn't have a lot of shine on here to begin with, so I'm going to put the salt on right away. All right, so I've put some salt on there. We're going to just leave it to do its thing. And um, I'm eager to get down here, but I don't want to smear this. I'm going to wipe off this plastic. This tape is very plastic, so I don't want to put my hand in it. So I need to wipe that off. So I'm pulling off this tape and you can see that this has now got um, a very distinguished um, or distinctive, I guess, <laughs> distinctive um, texture there. Um, it's almost like a, um, like an arborite, you know, when you get in those arborite tabletops and it has that little pebbly uh, gritty texture to it. Um, that's quite nice. So in terms of creating different stone effects, now I didn't make this one the shape of a stone, but that easily could have been a stone. This one's dry enough. I can come in and start doing some different textures on this. Now this is one of my very favorite techniques, and it is dry brush. So with dry brush, you need to be working on a dry surface, and this is now dry. There was a, a, gran a couple of granules of salt on there, but that doesn't matter. And I'm going to be painting not with the tip of the brush, but I'm going to be painting with the side of the brush. I also need to make sure that my brush has a blot, you know, that I've blotted my brush on paper towel here. 
So for this, I'm going to use just a dark blue here. This is called in Dan Throne Blue. It's a beautiful color. But I just I'm just picking random colors, not <clears throat> not necessarily anything in particular. But I didn't you can see on my palette this is this isn't really a wet wet puddle. I can actually pull it all together. Like see I can actually gather it up. So it's fairly sticky paint. And I'm gonna make sure that I take any excess off of my brush. And I'm really getting, see I'm holding my brush overhand. So I'm actually using the side of the bristles. And I'm gonna follow the contour of the rock. So if I can see that where the highlight is, I can see where the shadow is. So I'm gonna follow that shape. And I'm just gonna come along here and follow that contour. There we go. So I have, I get these beautiful broken edges to that stroke and it gives me kind of a stripe on that rock or, or just a ran, I could go, you know, kind of let them all overlap and just make it sort of um, overall. But, um, but I could make it lines, I could make it anything, right? So already I've got the saran wrap. I've got these, the salt dry brush spatter and so for some other ways of using some of these techniques um, there's one I've forgotten oh uh, yes oh yes there's one I've definitely forgotten so I'm gonna knock off the excess salt so I'm basically just tipping my board and giving it a tap to take off the excess salt And I'm going to do, um, I'm going to use, uh, well, let me just draw another. My, it was a puddle on this and it ran down, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to draw another uh, stone. Let's do another one right here. Try not to make them too perfect and oval, because rocks aren't like that. So, uh, all right. So I'm going to take some. I'm going to take some neutral tint just for to change it up a little bit here. So I'm going to take some neutral tint, and maybe. something reddish just for fun here we'll come in and get some warm tones in there and cool tones Oop. it's a great thing about a lot of stones is they they often have a lot of variety in them so for this one what I want to do is I want to do a bit of scraping so for this I'm actually taking my palette knife and I'm laying the, the flat edge down and then tipping it and I'm pushing against, pushing it away from me. So and I'm wiping off anything. Now some parts of it are drier than others and so I'm going to get more variation in this which I actually love and I'm just scraping away. to create some textures. And I can even put some like skinny fractures in it or something just by sort of pulling I'm not instead of pushing against the blade. I'm actually kind of cutting with it. Right? So I'm cutting in and what happens when you damage the paper like that and you kind of press into it is that the paint gathers in that spot. I can show you an even more pronounced uh, version of that if I take, I'll do this rock here. 
Let's do this one a little, I'm going to do this one a little more red. Yeah, you probably heard that. <laughs> I was wondering how I was going to manage today with all the noise. Sometimes it gets almost deafening with the work that's being done, but it's got to be done, so. This was an insurance claim from summer <laughs> that's finally getting taken care of. Um, all right, so I'm again, I'm trying to keep that light side, dark side of the rock. And let's put some stripes on this rock. So this time, instead of using my, my uh, palette knife to scrape with, I'm going to press into the paper using this tool, which is a stylus. And it's, it's, if you're not familiar with a stylus, it's a, it's a little wooden tool, has a little end. There's a tiny, uh, like a nice little ball on the end of it uh, that you know keeps you from cutting your paper. It's just got this nice little... Um, embossing type of ball on the end and uh, for this I'm going to do some stripes on this rock and you can see when I press into it that those lines immediately go dark right so I can create some really cool effects with just the stylus and create effect there so let's let's talk about different ways of using some of these techniques um, in in the um, little uh, intro for this you saw that i had um, some bark or some some wood i should say but <clears throat> if i were doing bark i'm going to take let's take some colors that you might find on bark so sometimes it it can be, you can sometimes get blues or greens in your bark. It's not all, uh, it's not always just brown. So sometimes there's green and there's lots of different textures in here. So I'm, I'm filling this up and when I do, so I'm doing a tree, tr you know, tree bark here. So as I do this, I want to make sure that all these colors that I'm mixing in here are going to be of similar, you know, they're the same consistency. I don't have one that's drier than another. I don't have one that's um, super dark and super one super light kind of thing. I'm trying to get a hair out of there. But I have them all pretty similar, okay? So lots of different colors, but there's similar similar um, humidity levels or moisture levels right so the the paint is not drier in one spot than another so all right so i'm just putting in a variety of, of different colors on here And I can use this same stylus and I can start scribbling. So as I scribble, and I know a few of you have taken classes with me and you, you may have seen this already, but uh, I can come in and scribble in uh, a really good bark texture pretty, pretty quickly. To do this with a brush, I could do this with a brush, but um, and I will probably do a little more embellishment with a brush, but for the time being, I can create a pretty good convincing bark texture just by scribbling with this stylus. Now I can't undo it. This is very important to know. It's because once you score the paper, it's damaged, right? So those marks are going to be there. Um, what colors for rocks number six? 
oh, I think I used I used some of the mud that was on my palette, and um, I think I added a little bit of um, um, permanent rose to it. So I had some burnt sienna permanent rose. Uh, there was probably some other stuff in there. Color doesn't really matter too much as long as I know that I'm not using, um, you know, heavy stainers. Well, and actually, in this case, it doesn't matter. It's for the salt. You don't want the heavy staining color. But um, anyway, so this this is a great way to create some bark. Now, if if this were a tree trunk, I probably would need to have, you know, the shadow side as well. Remember that core shadow I talked about on the rocks? Well, I would need to do a similar thing on the bark. And you can actually add more after the scoring is done because the scoring is not going to go away now. The scoring is quite, quite uh, permanent at this point. So let's say I want to get a little bit more shadow on this one side, for example. Now I can wait for that to dry and if I wanted to do some really dark, dark lines, I could come in with my brush and darken a few very easily. Uh, but this gets this gets a lot of work done very quickly because to get a brush and do fine lines like that is really tough. So it's, it's very fun to uh, just sort of scribble on your paper. And to do that, I actually just kind of went up and down like I didn't go back and forth I didn't go circles it was basically just sort of up and down zigzaggy type of scribbles and um, I just want to I'm just reading through the, the uh, comments here um, could see if I missed anything here I did see one question that I answered um, Okay, I guess I haven't scrolled back far enough. Something's been cancelled. <laughs> oh, a festival. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm just reading through comments. Yeah, yeah, Mary, it's definitely something that, you know, you, you, you get the feel for. And it's great to take a piece of paper like this and just play. Um, just play, play, play. In fact, if you have a watercolor sketchbook, I really recommend um, keeping these samples. You know, make notes about it. Like, let's say this was this was uh, cobalt and burnt sienna and salt. All right, so I know that that rock has that combination. And you make little notes about what you've done for each one of these. You can take little squares and just, you know, do little squares of these different techniques and um, make a note of the colors you used and the, the technique that you used. Um, you know, you, you don't have to do it all together like this. I don't have a lot of space for... Um, uh, for writing, but I could put scored, you know, that sort of thing. Um, this was crimson and panes. And you just make notes about all of the things that you've used so that you um, have an idea. This one's dry brushed. You know, just make whatever notes that are relevant to you. Uh, spattered paint and water. Right, so you're, you're just going to make yourself some notes. Then you have something to refer back to the next time you're doing a, a landscape or something like that, and you want to include some of these elements, then you'll have something you can refer to. Um, <clears throat> so, different ways of using some of these, okay, so 
salt. Rocks are great. Rocks have so many different types of, of textures and things on them uh, that, you know, you, you can use it on any kind of rock, right? Definitely rocks. But what else can you use it in? So one of my favorites, and I I'm, think I showed this in a previous video a while back, but um, not recently, so I'm going to show it to you now. I'm going to take some greens. Um, let's take some sap green here and I'm going to use the side of my brush here and just so I can get some uh, broken edges right and I'm going to put I want to get this a little darker one of my favorite ways of getting a really nice dark green is take a yellow I'm going to use areolan and Payne's gray Payne's gray is good and dark so it'll get you a dark 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 green Look at that. Nice green, huh? So I can come in and I can get some really good dark greens out of this. So I'm going to use a combination light and dark. I want those little holes in there sometimes, but to get some trees and I'm using the side of my brush because the side of my brush gives me those gorgeous broken edges. Right. All right. So from here, um, I can I can come in and just sort of continue this down into a tree trunk like that. All right. So I'm going to drop in some darker colors along some of this and looking at my monitor for it because I have a lot of glare on my paper. And for this, I'm just going to sprinkle some salt in here. And what this will give me is some really gorgeous um, feeling of foliage. Now I have some blossoms and things that are happening in here. Don't worry about it. Let it happen. That's that's nature's way. So uh, the watercolor will give you this gorgeous texture. And this is really too small to do any of the um, scoring or anything into, but you know, I might, you know, I could scribble a little bit and see what I get. And if you're doing a tree, I would really suggest uh, connect it to a ground or something <laughs> rather than having it float in air. So I'm taking some of the tree and I'm actually letting it go into the ground. There. That looks better. So I did get a little bit of texture on that tree, tree trunk, uh, but I don't want to get too detailed there. So there's a tree. You could put different colors in there for fall or anything else. Um, that would work just fine. For uh, wood, okay, so here we have a tree trunk, but what about wood textures? So the one that I showed on the intro was this um, really nice wood texture. So for that, I need to start with a, a main color. So I'm going to just take some warm color here. I'll use burnt sienna, maybe a little raw sienna as well. Neutral tones anyway. Find something neutral on your palette. Thin it down and get the salt off the paper. And I'm going to paint a wash of this. Now I deliberately left a couple of little white areas there because that's interesting, right? I'm going to maybe take some bits of red and pull that down there too in no particular order. Just drop some of that in so that there's a little bit of variation. So I'm just going to leave that to dry. I'll come back to that one because I can't put the texture on when it's super wet. Um, the, oh, the saran. Okay, the, for the saran, this is a technique that I have used 
in other paintings where I wanted to show, for example, a bird and I wanted to have the background looking like it's forest or woods or, you know, just you know, when you get a whole mass of, of branches and, and things like that that are going on. But to actually physically paint all of those branches would give everything very, like it would make everything jump forward because you're painting positively on a background. And it it doesn't give, it, first of all, it's a little too sharp, a little too crisp, and so it brings it forward. And secondly, it doesn't look natural. So I'm going to do, let's say I've got a little bird here. So I'll, I'll do a little, let's do a little cardinal and, so this is my little cardinal. So that's my little cardinal shape and I want to do a background around this. So I'm going to take my paint. Let's say it's a winter scene, okay? Because often you see one of the easiest times of year to see birds is in the winter because you don't have, they can't hide as well. <laughs> There's no leaves. So I'm going to come in here with a variety of blues and, and various things. I'm going to paint around the bird. Oh gosh, you know what? I could do textures for a week and still not cover everything, but um, they have a longer tail, so I'm going to make his tail a little longer. And um, There are so many different techniques that could be used. So I'm putting all this color in around my background for my cardinal. You know, if there was a branch there, I might paint around that as well, but this is just for example purposes. Sorry for the racket inside. Pretty sure you can hear that. It's really loud to me. Okay, so I'm making sure it's all similar texture here, or similar, uh, not necessarily an even wash, but a similar, um, like I don't have dry spots and wet spots. The, the moisture, the amount of water on the paper is all similar. All right, so I'm putting some variety in here. Oh, what the heck. We'll put in some warm colors too, which will just sort of blossom and make some interesting stuff. And I'm going to take that saran wrap that I had. And I'm going to crumple it up. Now, if you've, got a, if you've got a full background and you've got a bigger piece, you're going to need probably several pieces of, of this because you can't crumple a whole thing and, and lay it down. But... Um, okay, so I'm going to crumple this and push it down. And I'll have to leave this to dry. Um, all right, so hopefully I get some really good textures here. I would actually recommend if you um, taped off the bird would be the one of the best ways to protect it. If you put masking fluid on the bird, the plastic really sticks to the masking fluid. So uh, masking fluid isn't necessarily the best option for uh, protecting something here, but tape, like I showed for this one, tape like that would work very well. So I'm going to put that on. I have to leave that to dry, and, and that's going to take a little while. But what happens when I take that off, and then I do a little bit of negative painting or something like that, then I can get a really good effect. So let's come over here now to our wood. Our wood is getting dry enough. I think I can work into it. And now some people will take a fan brush, and they will they will pull it down. They might use a larger, I have a larger one, just not at my disposal at the moment. But they'll take a fan brush and they will take it and they'll sort of twist it and turn it as they come down and they can get some wood 
textures that way. There is actually a wood graining tool that you probably saw um, at, at, the, uh, at the paint store that they have this wood graining tool. But that, you know, really meant for something else other than watercolor. So it doesn't work very well on this. So for this, I'm just going to take some diluted warm tones again. And I'm going to start to just draw down some, some lines. And I'm leaving little gaps in between. And sometimes what happens is you're going to get where it kind of tapers to one spot. Let's pull this down like this. Right, so it tapers to one spot and it goes around the wood. So, you know, that sort of thing. So I'm leaving little gaps there. And I'm still not going to be done with this, but I, I wanted to get some, uh, some of the graining happening. Trying to move this plastic out of the way without actually disturbing my other painting. Now, there's all different kinds of wood. Keep that in mind. Look closely at the type of wood you're doing, and you may find that you have things like knots and, and stuff like that. So let's, I'll, I'll maybe put a knot into this one. But I'm just going to build this up in layers here. There. So we've got we've got some a little bit of that sort of graining happening there. Probably should have done some more straight ones, but there. That type of thing. So I'm, I'm getting some greening. So I'm actually leaving. This is negative painting, right? So I'm leaving these little veins in between, and. Um, I could have done that actually on one of these rocks up here as well. It's left some veins in there, some lighter colored veins. Um, let me see here. I, I think this is a little early, but I'm going to take a peek. Not too bad. I'm going to pull this off. Um, it, it would be more pronounced once, like those lines would be a lot sharper once it was all dry, but uh, we don't have all that much time, so I'm going to maybe take my dryer and just just dry this and show you what else I can do. I'll mute. Okay, so you can see why I suggested masking off the bird rather than just painting around it. Okay, you can see why I did that because once you put the serrad wrap on, it push, it moves the paint and then you get this really rough edge on the bird. So it you would need to protect your main subject if you were doing this technique with, with this background. So for this, I would take and simply um, use some of the shapes that I'm seeing there and just start creating some negative uh, branches. So let's paint. I'm just painting with some of this uh, Payne's Gray here. And I'm painting in big areas and just kind of like this, I'm leaving little slivers of what's behind. And some of the texture, some of that texture is still going to be there and it's going to look very, um, uh, like there's a whole lot of branches and things. So it will, 
without actually having to paint a million and one branches, right? It, it will just look like forest and it can be a very nice effect. Right? And it'll just make it look like some are further away than others. And I, you can see the idea there anyway. So. so some different ways of using these textures. Um, and you can get as creative as you want. I actually I really encourage it. You know, just really get creative with this stuff. If you have a reference picture and it doesn't have any texture and you want to add texture to it, try one of these. Just put it in where it doesn't, where there isn't any in the original picture. Um, yes, Diane, that palette is from, my palette is from Studio Six. It's called a color wheel palette. Um, Yeah, so I guess one thing I should really show, and maybe I'll do this next week, is I, I how to have how to create a watercolor sketchbook, right? So there's a really good way to make one out of a full sheet of watercolor paper. So um, I'm gonna I, maybe I'll do that next week for for my demo. So um, all right, so I've I've added in a few negative painting. Um, things there and I'm going to come back to my wood grain here and this is where I'm going to start coming in and doing some dry brushing. So I'm going to let my brush be a little drier. I'll blot it. Actually I want to get my paint a little bit stickier than this. Stickier meaning that I have less water in it. And I'm blotting it and I'm painting with the side. and painting, blot my brush. So I'm getting a similar effect to what I had over here on this rock. And I'm going to use some cool colors here as well. And now I'm going to go a little more. Um, let me create some, a little bit of shadow on some of these. So I'm going to come down the, the edge of that vein. And create a little bit of shading on this rock. So I'm, I'm getting some warm and cool happening at the same time. Oh, I forgot to put the I forgot to put a knot in here. So let's let's get a knot in here. So I'll put one right here. But the best way I've found to do um, these wood grain textures is uh, multiple layers. Like let one layer dry, then come back and do another one, and then do another one. So, um, yeah, putting putting your exercises in a binder is a great way to um, have a have an ongoing reference, and it's better to do your own rather than just you know say print off something from the internet. Um, it's at, it's better to do your own. Actually, feel what it feels like to to create all these textures and stuff. Um, so, I'm going to come in now and, uh, let's do a little bit more on this knot.
And now I'm just coming in with some thin paint and just doing a little bit of detail. Um, those, you know, the lines, the texture on the on the wood grain and that sort of thing. So getting all kinds of um, the grain of the wood happening here. Now depending on you know what kind of wood you're doing, like this one looks pretty rough, right? This this looks like old wood. And so that's that's the effect I was actually trying to get is this old wood look. But you might have something that looks quite new. Like let's say you're doing a still life and you have a, a nice mahogany table or something like that or you know cherry wood or something like that. You know they all have different colors. They all have different textures and things like that. Some wood grain, some wood grains have like little flecks in it, like little little tiny little lines um, in it, and that sort of thing. So it depends on the type of wood that you're creating. But uh, there's usually a combination of dry brush in there. First of all, a wash, right? Get rid of the white paper. Don't try to don't try to start doing wood grain on white paper. Put the wash in first, then put the then put the wood grain and the textures and things on top of that first wash. So you get rid of that white paper to begin with. Look for the the underlying color, the, the lightest value in your wood. That'll be your first wash. Then come in and start putting in some of your dry brushing, some of your um, vein lines and, and knots and things like that. So build it up gradually. And... Uh, you can get some pretty good effects. Just tone that down. So that looks like a pretty rough wood, very similar to what what you saw in the intro. Um, that that intro actually had some uh, peeling paint on it, and you can actually see the, the peeling paint on that. And so you had the paint here, for example. Let's say this was the paint. And you could actually see the wood grain through it because the paint had um, faded so much. So let's let's say there's a wood grain on this. It's too wet to do anything with, but but then I created dimension by coming under it with some shadow. Like because the way the light was hitting it, it was creating some shadow. So it ended up making it look like the paint was curling up or, or lifting, right? So that type of thing where you have the paint sort of peeling off of the wood. Um, yeah, so so lots of lots of different ways. Oh my gosh. And I should say that once your salt effect is done, like it's all dry, this is this is pretty dry now. If you rub this, it's kind of stuck to the paper because it was wet and it, you put it on wet and it dissolved a little bit. So it's a little hard on your hand. So I just used my palette knife and I gently release the salt. Right? And once it's fully dry, that'll remove very easily. Okay. This, this one may not be dry enough yet, but we'll see. But you can see how it, it kind of looks like a cluster of leaves in the tree. It gives you some texture. Okay, so then I can just knock that off. Brush that aside. And there's our textures. Okay, so so this salt turned out a little bit lighter than this one. I, I thought it'd be more pronounced difference there, but not so much. Um, scoring, saran wrap, uh, dry brush, spatter, all kinds of things. Have, have a heyday. I mean, just find all kinds of things. Look for ways of adding texture into your painting um, so that everything doesn't look like it's made of the same materials. So. Anyway, so we didn't really create a painting today, but we had a heck of a lot of fun just experimenting and learning different ways of doing this. 
And gosh, this is not the end of all the textures that are available. There's all kinds um, that you can create, but um, experiment. Find, find new ways and, and let me know what you come up with. Um, it's, oh, Margo, you were asking about the water, water wheel palette. It's, I don't think it's Daniel Smith, no. I, I found my receipt, because somebody else had asked me earlier about this particular palette. I found my receipt and I couldn't find a brand name on it. It just said color wheel palette. So, um, you know, that was the big lettering on the box. Anyway, it's big color wheel palette. So that's, uh, that's my palette. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm just reading some of the last comments, make sure I didn't skip over any questions. Um, yeah, so next week uh, we'll look at doing a uh, watercolor, creating your own watercolor sketchbook. Now, I like to do it with my favorite paper, okay? So I, I do almost all my painting on Arches 140 pound cold press. So that's what I'm going to make my sketchbook out of because if I learn one way to do all these textures on one kind of paper, it may not turn out the same on another kind of paper because every, every paper behaves differently. So. Pick a piece of your favorite uh, watercolor paper and we'll make a sketchbook next week. Okay? Anyway, thanks everybody. Have a super week and we will talk to you later. Thanks for joining. Bye.